What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final final little pass is a business. A dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, your horror safe haven. I'm Chelsea. And I'm James. And we're engaged and we like to get scared together. And have guests like Joey Clift on it. Yeah, yeah hey but Joey's here. Joey, you're back. Yeah, hey everybody. I'm glad to be back. And I'll, I gotta say, I'm terrified to be here. This is, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, get scared. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. You're in our Noises. new set, too. Yeah. I'm so excited to like have someone back. That's not Gressel on the new set. <laughs> you are the first guest since the pandemic uh, who doesn't live here to be on yeah. the, the um, podcast. Look, I might live secretly in the garage somewhere. You don't know that. <laughs> you know, part of that garage uh, is messy enough to where you could. That's why I'm scared as I'm usually hiding from both oh of you. God. And I'm like, oh, no, what have I even we found out? We have a pool floaty that's um, like an in and out a uh, french fry basket you oh, just that's probably tip your bed, that huh? over and like yeah like, <laughs> yeah that's out. where I, yeah that's where i sleep yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, i love but, it yeah this is definitely the first in-person podcast i've recorded since like march of 2020 oh yeah. yeah it's gonna it's gonna be weird and awkward I, it's, it's gonna be great i'm excited <laughs> yeah. but we're gonna we're gonna talk about wrestling joey that's hell yeah. horror yeah great. specifically i'm excited this that podcast. this episode's gonna be like totally different vibes from your last one this one's gonna be very silly and goofy yeah yeah, yeah. the last one you might have learned something from me talking about indian burial grounds i guarantee you will learn nothing from <laughs> this <laughs> well they will learn that anyone uh that you are the person to blame for us being into wrestling that's because true. Oh, yeah. in 2019, in January, you invited us to watch the Royal Rumble at your place. And we did. And that was when we started watching wrestling. <laughs> and so anyone who has noticed the uptick in wrestling references on the yeah. channel since it's 2019. All this guy. <laughs> this guy to thank and or blame. Well, let's talk about why wrestling and horror has such a crossover audience. Because I think it's, it's a weird thing. Because at first you maybe wouldn't see an immediate connection besides like i guess the violence but even like you know it's not gore i mean sometimes it is <laughs> you're getting a little bit more extreme but i don't know like let's just talk about like why so often when you meet a wrestling fan they tend to like horror movies and vice versa i feel like they the appreciation of both come from kind of similar like guttural emotional places in that, uh, you know, we were just talking, I think, before we started recording of the the Lucha Bros versus the Young Bucks all out in an amazing cage match. There's a spot, uh, a spot in a match is kind of when a wrestler does a thing to another wrestler. We're going to have to explain where, so yeah, 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 There's a lot of like, yeah, like it's like kayfabe heels, yeah. faces. Yeah. Get ready. Um, That's, by yeah. the way, shout out to research assistant Bella, who just started very recently. Yay, research assistant. Yay. Long time coming. So Bella has a whole, like, she has like a glossary. Oh, here, great, great, great. Because yeah. we will need, we will need them, yes. Um So uh, one wrestler in the match uh, put on a shoe with thumbtacks on the bottom of the shoe and then did what's called a super kick where you kick another wrestler in the face. It's just a kick. It's, a, it's just a kick to the face. Uh, <laughs> what makes it super is they slap right before they do it to make the sound. But uh, so one wrestler did it to another wrestler and the other wrestler, of course, started bleeding from their face as you would if you were kicked with thumbtacks. And like the, I feel like the emotional like, oh, I can't believe that that happened is like the same as watching just like a really gory, cool kill in a horror movie, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's this, like I feel like it's a similar, like the the the, Part of my lizard brain that appreciates that is the same that appreciates this. You know? I've, I've always said that it's an appreciation of uh, faked violence where, yes. you know, with wrestling, obviously, I, I, I don't know how far back to go with wrestling in this podcast to explain to people because there are going to be people watching, listening to this who have never watched a single frame of professional wrestling. They just always hear us talking about. It. So I'm sure there are people who sit there like, wait, isn't that all fake? And it's like, yes, it's scripted. The outcomes are scripted. The stories are all scripted. Uh, the moves are done in a way to minimize the actual damage being done to someone. But you can only do that so much. These athletes are still putting their bodies through these things. They learn how to take falls in a way to uh, maximize, like, uh, the impact, uh, the absorb the impact as much as possible. You know, McFoley always said he could take bumps because of his um, a bump. Is, <laughs> yeah. That's a, <laughs> a, a bump is um what taking a a bump is it's taking a fall yeah so if you are um 
if you're thrown off of the top of the top rope and you land on your back, that is a bump. Yes. And Mick Foley, my favorite wrestler of all time. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> always said that he was good at taking bumps because of his wide back and wide ass. And it just like gave him the most surface area to land on and minimize the damage. But uh, yeah, these people are, you know, oftentimes they are risking their bodies for sure. Mm -hmm. And some things you can't fake that much like a Terry Funk punch. I mean, I compare it to doing stunt work where it's like the Mm -hmm. whole point of a stunt is it's creating something that, you know, is real to a point, but it's, you know, it's part of a movie or whatever you're filming it for. And, but being a stunt actor is still incredibly dangerous, even if it's in a situation where you're doing everything you can to minimize risk. Um, you're wearing like a burn suit. You're not actually right. being set on fire, but still the act of putting on a burn suit and being set on fire is like, you know, dangerous to an extent. Same with wrestling. It's- yeah. Pro wrestling, it's sort of like a live action stunt show yeah. done in front of an audience. Like in a in a way that like, uh, yeah, like if you are, if you're jumping out of the ring and doing like a 450 splash onto a guy through a table outside of the ring, like gravity still applies to you (laughs) that's still gonna suck to land chest first on somebody from 10 feet up and go through a table like um you know if you're taking um you know a chop like that's something where the noise of that is a hand hitting your chest as hard as somebody possibly can Mm -hmm. so it's still gonna like sting you know um it's just these are these are people that are not actively trying to hurt each other and that's the thing that is important to me because i've never been into mma or like actual boxing or anything because i don't want to see people actually try to hurt each other but with wrestling what's impressive is they're doing things that look like they hurt but they're trying to make sure the other person doesn't get hurt yeah also mma does not have uh like a magical undead zombie wizard (laughs) yeah that's also big points for professional wrestling is yeah we've got like magic and monsters and it's i remember when we first started watching wrestling together i asked james how far does it go story like in the universe of wrestling? Kayfabe. Kayfabe, exactly. <laughs> you want to explain what kayfabe is? Uh, yeah, kayfabe is the agreed upon fake reality in universe of pro wrestling, right? Yeah. So uh, kayfabe is what happens in front of the camera. Um, so like, uh, you know, if two wrestlers are having a feud with each other, you know, they're currently having matches with each other, you know what a feud is, I don't have to explain that. <laughs> um, then um, like in kayfabe, they hate each other. Yeah. So if they're keeping up kayfabe in real life, if you were like going to a small wrestling show and you see these two wrestlers afterwards, you know, like in the food court or at a subway or something like that, they're going to keep up kayfabe and pretend that they hate each other at this subway. Yeah, if you um, see them eating a f- food together and like cheersing, they are breaking kayfabe. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, I learned, I did not know this, but this was in the notes that Bella made for me. Apparently, Vince, in the 80s, to avoid tax regulations, <laughs> um, Vince testified to state authorities that wrestling was performance. And so he broke kayfabe to avoid paying taxes on stuff. Yeah, uh, Vince McMahon, the 75-year-old owner of WWE. Yes. <laughs> uh, he's uh, a madman in good ways and bad ways. <laughs> so, is, I'd say yeah. mostly bad. But there are <laughs> always things about him that does impress me. I, I, listen, I don't think he's a good human being. But they're like the fact that he will always do whatever he is asking a wrestler to do. I just saw a video of him. Uh, yeah, he was he was taking. Was a it Gronk fall. who did a fall? It was Gronk at yeah. last year's WrestleMania. Yeah. Uh, and Vince was like, "No, yeah, it's not that hard. All you gotta do is fall off and land on your back like this." And this seventy-four-year-old man hopped off like a scaffolding that's like fifteen <laughs> feet up onto a crash pad, gets up, and is like, "That's all you gotta do." Doesn't always have to prove it. Sometimes he wants to, and you don't have to. Okay, he's gonna do it anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I he's... do, I do appreciate that. But he's he's a maniac who apparently what was his snack of choice? It's a steak wrap. Steak, steak wrap. Yeah, which yeah. is like, isn't it like it's like well done steak with ketchup or something? In Wrapped a... up in bread. I forget. Yeah, it's okay. So yeah, the deal is is that he, <laughs> um, he does not know what a burrito is. <laughs> yeah, at yeah. Don't po- call the burrito. Yeah, 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 yeah. At some point, somebody was like, "Hey, we should get burritos for lunch," and he was like, "A burrito? What's that?" And this was like 2012, <laughs> and somebody was just like, "Oh, so it's like a it's like a tortilla like with meat wrapped around it and beans and stuff like that." 
And then he was like, oh, like a steak wrap. And he realized that, oh, he's been eating a burrito for lunch every single day <laughs> for like 50 years or something like that. <laughs> he just always wrap. called it a steak wrap and not a burrito. God, and he it. eats them because he hates that you have to eat because it takes up time and he's just a workaholic. There are th I honestly some things. I relate to that. Yeah, I relate to that. I think food is annoying. Yeah. It takes yeah. up time. <laughs> but then he will also get mad at you if you uh, sneeze in front of him. And nod. He doesn't like nodding, doesn't apparently. Like nodding. Yeah, doesn't like nodding because he feels like you're influencing his decision if you nod at him. Yeah. And again, these are all things that are quote unquote common knowledge about Vincent K. McMahon. <laughs> Who knows if they are actually true? I think they are. I believe all of those things. Ba based on all of the stories that I've heard from people who work for WWE, I think those are true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Bella included this quote about kayfabe from a Harper's article I thought was really great. Uh, it's by the author's Michael Brick. Uh, and he said, when you know you're faking and the audience knows you're faking and you know the audience knows you know you're faking because the fact that pro wrestling is fake has been documented, verified, and repeated to the point of cliche, and yet you stay in character on the walk from the locker room to your Mazda just in case someone is pointing his phone's camera at you from a window above the alley. That's kayfabe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that rules. I yeah. love that. <laughs> yeah, it's like total escapism, which is where I think the connection between horror and wrestling comes into is it's like it's escapism and es Specifically escapism in terms of watching something violent happen or violence being done to another person where it's like the comfort of knowing it's not real. Um, to put it in haunted house terms, if you go to a haunted house and somebody jumps at you dressed like Freddy Krueger and you like, you know, scream because a scary thing happened, it would take away from it. If immediately after that he pulled up his cell phone and like called one of his friends and was like, "Yo, I totally just scared something." <laughs> right, right, yeah, right. Not really Freddy Krueger. So it's like keeping kayfabe is him staying in character for the duration of you being in the haunted house. You know? Yeah, it's like almost a deal they make yeah. with you as the audience that like I'm gonna stay in this character because it's to your benefit. It's to your enjoyment of this thing that I don't break the illusion of this, even if you know you know it's not real. I know it's not real, but it's way more fun if we're all just playing you know, pretend together. And what's interesting is that in the modern day of social media and stuff, there is there are more dimensions to kayfabe because uh, we go to a wrestling show, we boo the bad guys, we cheer the good guys, and I'm having a good time with it. I'm not trying to be a, a smart mark. I'm not even going to get into that. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to try to be an asshole and like, you know, mess with the program. But at the same time, I do like to see some of these bad guys, these heels, uh, just be themselves. Baron Corbin, we did an interview with him He's talking about nice the birds. Man. He loves Hitchcock's The Birds. Right. And we talked about the birds for a while. And it's like, that's not Baron Corbin. That was uh, Thomas uh, Pestock. Is that his real name? I think so. Yeah. Uh, breaking kayfabe saying that. But, you know, th at, at this oh, point in time. Oh, you're going to so much locker room heat for that. <laughs> 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 like, at this point, we all know The Undertaker is Mark Calloway. Like, it's, you know, maybe in 94, it'd be a big deal if you said Mark Calloway. And yeah. he would like these are the real names of the wrestlers, yeah. Yeah. characters. There, Kane, yeah, yeah. the real guy is a mayor. Yes, yeah, he's uh, yeah, he. Uh, the, Kane, we'll have to talk about Kane. Yeah, yeah. Kane. He's um, I, I think that the best way to describe him is he's basically like Jason, like specifically Kane Hodder era Jason, if he was a pro wrestler yeah. with like a ton of different layers and like a backstory so convoluted they had to write a novel to keep it uh, to keep it like <laughs> clear. They? Which yeah, yeah. Who you wrote could, that? Uh, I I don't know. <laughs> Someone There's, who didn't get paid enough. Yeah, there is a an in character. <laughs> biography that you can buy of Kane on Amazon for like three bucks that's like hundreds of oh pages my long oh my God. About, about Kane and Undertaker's backstory. Uh, and then he became uh, the scariest thing of all, which is the libertarian mayor of a, no, of a Tennessee, Tennessee. Of a Tennessee town. Well, going that back is to real. You. He is the mayor yeah, of a town Yeah, that's like Tennessee. real life, actually. That's not part of the Kane's story, although that would be although great, that does, too. Although that does loop back in. He's come back as the mayor of Knox County and put on the mask and beat people up <laughs> Did before. Did he win the 24-7 championship? As Glenn Jacobs, the mayor of Knox County. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just like Love he'll it. come in. It's like his his kayfabe is kind of weird in that he'll come in, you know, wearing a suit and tie as like the mayor of Knox County, and then he'll sigh and put on his mask <laughs> and then start choke slamming. I'll never people. forget at Undertaker's last thing. Uh, I forget was it WrestleMania. It was some pay per view. Uh, Wait, the Boneyard last... match? Uh, no, it was like his last. <laughs> It wasn't even a match. It was just him coming out, and it was in the Thunderdome. So that was when it was just TV screens all around because it was the oh, pandemic it was like Survivor era. Series, like the yeah. Like, and he yeah. just came out, yeah. and all the the fake fans, like literally the the fans, piped in, were like, "Thank you, Taker." <laughs> But 
but it was a bunch of uh like legends coming out and thanking him and all the guys came out just dressed normal and then here comes kane in his outfit <laughs> <laughs> like glenn jacobs dressed as kane well going back to what i was i was uh asking you james like when we first started watching this stuff together is you know i i was confused as to how far it goes like concerning kayfabe like Mm -hmm. it are there wrestlers where the characters are magic and everyone plays into that and these characters legitimately have like magic or supernatural powers and the answer to that's yeah like undertaker (laughs) is actually like an he's undead right he was he was yeah yeah, he can shoot out lightning, which he does during matches. He can control the lights going up and down. Kane can shoot out fire. fire yeah. But even, you know, that used to be a thing. So wrestling, as with most, most forms of entertainment, has gone through eras. And uh, I watched heavily during the Attitude Era, which was wrestling at its most popular. Yeah, it was popular. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah, The, the Rock. Rock. Yeah, so that yeah. was like 96 uh, to like 2003. Yeah, thereabouts. And then... Uh, Attitude Era 2.0, Ruthless Aggression, was 03 to 07. That was like John Cena. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, Cena's like the best thing. Uh, And then they went PG after that. And I feel like, with with good reason, but uh, I feel like after that, they toned down the supernatural stuff. But even nowadays, you have Alexa Bliss shooting fireballs at Randy Orton's face on occasion. Yeah, making Randy Orton just like vomit black goo, (laughs) whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I love the like kind of, gimmicky supernatural stuff because if i was like i would just be magic (laughs) it's like a little bit less work you have to do if you're just casting fireball at all of your opponents granted that doesn't make you a very interesting wrestler but uh (laughs) i think if you can if if all of your moves were fireballs i would be like oh that's a real interesting wrestler that's a gimmick (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah for sure um it's weird that they kind of leaned away from doing that stuff when they went more PG. Because in my brain, I'm thinking it would make more sense to lean into that because it's less physically violent and more, you know, imagination and just kind of uh, showmanship. Um, there was actually a wrestler in the PG era that I think checks a lot of these boxes. Um, his name was the Boogeyman. Oh, yeah. And, oh, I think um, he's- and uh, his catchphrase is, I'm coming to get you. And boy, <laughs> would he. <laughs> and, um, he what would, did he look like? Uh, so I guess that like Dar- like jacked Darth Maul would probably be a good way to put really? it. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard of Boogeyman. I've yeah. never seen a but match. But in my um, head, I'm like, that's Kane. I mean, can't, but uh, the Boogeyman would do face paint. He would come to the ring carrying a clock. And then he would say, like, one, two, coming for you, like that kind Uh of stuff. And then he would smash the clock over his head. And then he would take a big handful of worms and eat the worms. Then he would vomit the worms on his opponent. I like that. And uh, he had, like, a weird staff that shot out smoke. And it was very much like the it was like the PG version of a lot of the stuff that Kane and Undertaker did. He didn't like he wasn't a guy that would wrestle very long matches. Like a lot of it were what are called squash matches, which are really quick matches. But he was definitely like a, a fixture of I think WWE from like probably 2006 to 2010. Oh wow, okay. He, he still pops oh, up here man. and there. Yeah, see that would be like my wrestling aesthetic. I would be like throwing up worms. <laughs> everyone. Like that's that's a lot of fun to me. I mean, there's kind of some characters like that in AEW right now, like. We were talking about Abaddon right before we started rolling. Yeah, what's I mean, her deal? Because we, I've only seen her once uh, in the most recent AEW pay-per-view. I fell in love. Instantly. And immediately thought she was awesome. I yeah. tweeted at her and told her if she needs, like, a Paul Heyman, that I will be that for her. <laughs> you would be a good manager I would, for I want to be a manager so bad. I am obsessed with, like, all of the people who just are there to like put their hands on the side of their faces and be like all scared when they're when they're wrestlers in the ring. Um, a manager, uh, there's somebody that like escorts the wrestler to the ring and theoretically they're like behind, you know, they're, they're controlling all of the wrestlers like business bookings, I guess. I don't sure. know, what does a manager <laughs> do? But um, yeah, Abaddon is amazing. She, the best way to describe her is she's sort of like the ring slash the grudge, but a wrestler. So kind of like, uh, like a water ghost in terms of how she moves. She a like water ghost. she like crawls to the ring uh, in a very wheel in a way that's very ethereal. Then she'll like vomit blood onto herself. Um, she wears these crazy contacts. Her makeup looks like she's half dead. Her makeup is incredible. Yeah, it's real. great. I was honestly upset on her behalf when that. Um, rumble match she was only in it for like a few minutes i'm like that makeup took like four hours <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she's somebody that's so good at like embodying so there's 
there are a couple of different levels of wrestling in terms of like the, the skill set required to do the thing. One is your ability in the ring to just like, you know, do moves, have good timing, where if you super kick somebody, you do it in such a way that you don't actually give them a concussion. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, uh, and then there's like the character embodiment part of that in the boogeyman and like uh, early Undertaker were parts of that where it's like, oh, they're really good at embodying the character of this horror movie person. Like I buy that. And Abaddon is somebody who's like a master at just the character aspects of pro wrestling. Like if you like pro wrestling and horror, Google AEW Abaddon and yeah. just like indulge. Fall in She's love. great. I also want to say that's something that really impresses me about her and all these like really like fantasy gimmicky, like horror themed wrestlers too is it is I think so hard to come out into the ring, especially when everyone, you know, if they're, if it is like a rumble match or something and everyone who's in the ring already, maybe you don't have any characters out there yet who are like gimmick wrestling. You know, they're all yeah. like, you know, dressed like you would expect, like a, you know, standard wrestler to look, you know, and then you have Abaddon come out and she, I think is so good at making it not seem like, what the fuck is this? You know, it's like, a oh, cool. Like, Who's this? You're not like, oh, this is kind of weird or like, I don't understand what she's trying to do here. It just feels right, you know? Yeah, she like commits to it yeah, 500%. And it's like the first time that I saw her, I mentioned it, I think before we started recording of like, she came out crawling to the most like creepy metal music possible, looked directly into the camera, vomited blood out of her mouth up over her eye. And she was wearing a <laughs> contact that made her eye black or something like that. But because of that, her eye was red for the rest of the match from blood she vomited onto her so own face. So fucking cool. And so this like, sounds like a Gangrel kind of thing. A little bit. She, I'd say that she's Gangrel, but scarier. Gangrel uh, was like a vampire wrestler who yes. um, it was like a co-production with WWE and White Wolf who does like Magic the Gathering and stuff like that. Oh, whoa. Oh, I didn't yeah, know, yeah, know yeah. that. Yeah, like Gangrel is a, they did, no, Vampire the Masquerade. Um, so uh, Gangrel is like the name of a race in Vampire the Masquerade. Oh. And it was like, that's why in any pro wrestling video games, WWE video games from the 90s, uh, they would always say like Gangrel copyright, uh, like oh. White Wolf or whatever. Oh, I that kind of rings a bell. Uh, Gangrel would have been, uh, I don't know what year he premiered. I would like assume 96, 97. 97 yeah. Somewhere around there. And then he had The Brood, yeah. which was Edge and Christian. Yeah, Edge. Got my yeah, Edge yeah. shirt. Uh, and they were actual they were vampires uh i think kayfabe or at least a little bit <laughs> no they, they were shoot they were real vampires <laughs> they were real, but that's yeah, what yeah. i mean is like so kayfabe if, if edge and christian are vampire like they are in the story like they are actually vampires and at some point they would have had to have been turned into not vampires no right? well that's do the they thing just forget stuff? you just kind of forget stuff sometimes yeah. except for when they want to bring it up because recently uh with uh what was before extreme rules um, um wrestlemania no was it no. money in money the in the bank, bank. yeah I think was so. it like, and edge you. came <laughs> out to the brood music dressed as his, in his brood attire and came up out of the floor with all the the candles i popped so hard yeah, pop, pop is cheer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh yeah, cuz it was like he was like I have to tap into my past, my dark past. I used to hang out with the Undertaker in the Ministry of Darkness and hang out in the Brood when I was a vampire and like he came out as the Brood uh to fight was it Seth? Yeah, it was Seth Rollins. That's yeah. so cool. Um, and fucking cool. Uh, other great things about the brood, uh, they would do something called a bloodbath. Yeah. Where they would like beat a wrestler up and then dump blood on them. <laughs> uh, it's like getting slimed. Yeah, it was like getting slimed, <laughs> but like with blood. I don't know. Is that gross or less gross than getting slimed? Hey, want to talk to you about our sponsor this week, HelloFresh. So let's say you are a big wrestling fan and there's just too much wrestling. You've got Raw, you've got SmackDown, you've got NXT, you've got AEW, you've got uh, NJPW, all the wrestling brands. It's hours and hours per week. Oops, you have to feed yourself. Well, that's where HelloFresh comes in. HelloFresh is fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. It's gonna save you so much time, time you would otherwise be spending meal planning, shopping, etc. And since your schedule is very busy with all of your wrestling shows you gotta watch, HelloFresh is very flexible. They offer the flexibility you need to easily customize your order on the app within minutes so you can change 
change your delivery day, food preferences, plan size. You can even skip a week if you have to. So if you want to try HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash DeadMeat14 and use code DeadMeat14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. One more time, that is HelloFresh.com slash DeadMeat14 and use code DeadMeat14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. I'm presuming fake blood. I don't know. It's not like Carrie yeah. where we're going to the slaughterhouse and getting pig's blood to dump on someone. But often there's real uses of blood in wrestling. And we were talking about this a little bit beforehand. Um, the the concept of like blading and the, the thing with the thumbtacks on the shoes. And obviously it's going to make someone start bleeding. That's something that I think... Um, you know, it's such a line in wrestling where, you know, you lose some people, but other people, that's like the stuff they really want because it's so borderline. It feels so wrong almost. Well, that, nowadays, WWE does not do blood. Uh, rarely, if ever, right? Yeah, they, they definitely don't blade anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. so we'll explain blading. Yeah, um, if a wrestler accidentally bleeds in a match in WWE due to, like, you know, like uh, somebody, like, actually elbows them in the face or something like that, they'll stop the match. The referee will put on gloves and they'll, like, really quickly kind of, like, glue the cut back together or clean the blood off. But um, what blading is, is it's, it's like, exactly what it sounds like, where wrestlers will hide a, um, a tiny razor blade in their wrist tape or in their trunks, and then if they get hit like really hard during a match, they'll go down and they'll pull the razor blade out and they'll just like legit cut their forehead so real blood comes out. Yeah. And uh, it's it's something that's like uh, cool as hell. <laughs> yeah, I think it's extremely cool. Because the thing is, is, is your head and like the skin on your head, you have so many like capillary, like veins. Yeah. It's like it. I from my understanding, if you get cut like on your head, I had a, I had a friend in high school who we were like, you know, goofing around at his house, he accidentally hit the corner of a cabinet with his head. So much blood. It looked so much worse than it actually was just because up there, it's yeah. just, you cut your skin up there and you just bleed like, cra like yeah. crazy, which is why it works so well for this kind of trick. So it just looks so much worse than it is. It is gross to look at. I think it's very cool, but... But it, it is also like, to, to WWE's credit, with the advent of like HD cameras, mm. um, like... Yeah. You used to, because like cameras weren't as mm -hmm. high definition, a wrestler could do that all day and like their foreheads totally messed up from cutting themselves, you know, eight times a week for matches or something like that, that you can't really notice. But now it's like if you go back and you Google just like Abdullah the Butcher's that's forehead what or whatever, oh, yeah, no. it's yeah. like, oh, that's a guy, you know, like you could say like, oh, wrestlers use blood caps or it's fake blood or whatever. But it's like if you look at like Dusty Rhodes, Abdullah the Butcher, a lot of those guys' foreheads, it's just like, oh, this is somebody that like cuts their forehead as part of their job regularly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just ridges, like deep crevices, yeah, scars. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, you can't really do that nowadays. It feels very carny trick to me. Yeah. Well, that's that's the other thing is if you're still listening and uh, you, you're you not a wrestling fan, but somehow you've made it this far into the episode, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but wrestling comes from like carny. Like it's not really a sport. I think at one point, maybe in the distant past a hundred years ago, it was an actual sport, I think, right? I think it kind of, like, would have, I mean, from my understanding of it, I think it started as, like, an actual sport, but it was really boring <laughs> because it's just, you know, there's no, like, it's not like now where there's, you know, different moves and, like, different styles. It's literally just two dudes, like, kind of rolling around and, you know. It's not that exciting, is my understanding of it. Yeah, it was. Um, oh, I'm so excited to get into the deep nerd history. Yeah, yes, yeah, please. <laughs> um, so uh, up until around 1903, professional wrestling was a very legitimate thing. Matches would sometimes be three hours long because you're just watching <laughs> one guy try to pin another guy's shoulders to the mat for you know three seconds, a one, two, three count. Um, in 1903, there was a world championship match. I think between like. Hackenschmidt versus Gotch or something <laughs> where um, Hackenschmidt, one of the wrestlers who I think was the world champion at the time, his like knee was messed up and he knew that he was not going to win this match. So he basically told Gotch, the guy that he was wrestling, like, hey, I'll make a deal with you. I'll let you win, but you have to like pretend like you're like it's a good match and we're fighting for you know an hour or something like that. So like, you know, let's go for an hour and then I'll let you pin me because otherwise that way I at least look good in defeat. Um, and then it actually ended in a double cross where the guy who wasn't injured was like, oh, now I know you're injured. So he just like <laughs> it kicked oh him in the knee God. and threw him on the ground and pinned him. First that, heel move. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that was the first like 
I guess you could say professional wrestling match in the terms of like, oh, it's like a work, which a work is, you know, it's made up within the world of wrestling. But then since then, like wrestlers started doing that thing here and there where it's sort of like, you know, understanding that it's like a predetermined sport, you know, heels, faces, good guys, bad guys, um, you know, heroes, villains, stuff like that. And um, it's slowly morphed into this like carny sideshow thing where it's sort of like, you know, two carnival people would be like wrestling in a ring and like, you know, they're doing it to essentially like work the marks, which the marks are like, you know, what they call the fans in the day into paying money for what was like a genuine sport that they thought that they were watching. And, um, you know, now that we know that wrestling is at work, it's like, you know, predetermined. We appreciate it less for like, oh, like the Undertaker's actually going to murder Kane in this match. And we more appreciate it for like the athleticism. And then at a certain point, it's like, Oh, it doesn't matter if it's real or fake. I want the, you know, the Lucha Bros to win that cage match against the Young Bucks and it looks like they're going to lose it, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the just, showmanship. Yeah, the story. The, the story, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You definitely still get invested in, you know, the the outcome of matches like there's yeah. been something oh, yeah, yeah. You, you get pissed off or you're get, you know, it's it's an amazing, you know, unexpected turn that yeah, I think that's like the cool part is they there is still that element of suspense. It's not even though it's predetermined. It's often not super obvious. Here, maybe you guys can help me with something because um, we, uh, this year's Royal Rumble had just our friends Mike and Beth over. And I believe um, because Edge was the first or second yeah. participant. And he, he was number two. I number think. two. Yeah. And he ended up winning it. And uh, I was like, this is a big deal. Only however many wrestlers have started off in the number one position and Royal Rumble is a thing where every 90 seconds a new wrestler comes out it's my yeah, favorite. 30 to 40 wrestlers yeah, yeah. it's I like yeah 30 it. to 40 they have to be eliminated going over the top rope it's the best thing wrestling yeah, like should yeah. always be as many people as you can cram into the ring yeah. as possible yeah, the Royal Rumble is the most fun like it's like if somebody's new to wrestling the Royal that Rumble is, yeah. the, that's, the, that's the very and that's what one. you yeah. had us come over yeah. to watch yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was like there's only been like one or two wrestlers I forget who who have started at number one and gone all the way to win the rumble and I remember Beth being like but it, if it's scripted why does that matter and I actually had a hard time answering it of like why does that matter why does that make that person important and the best I could come up with was well it shows that the the company was believed in that person enough to make them seem that superhuman and mm -hmm. uh uh you know powerful to win that match and then also in the real like the actual real life thing they had the stamina to be in the ring that long and still put on a good show but uh are is there a better answer to that question of why does it matter yeah. if it's scripted that like cena has the record of 16 championships so you know? i think that the way to look at it is like kayfabe power levels so um do you mean like anime is that what you're talking yeah, about yeah i think yeah. That, like I think dragon that, ball i think that, yeah. i think that honestly like dragon ball is not a bad way to look at it in that like you know if we we understand that goku or vegeta are tough in dragon ball z so if krillin can step to vegeta and beats vegeta then that like means a lot about krillin's abilities yeah like you know, you know, like if Frieza immediately tanks Piccolo, then you're like, wow, Frieza's really tough. So if there's a wrestler who's like story you're invested in, who you really like, who's never won the championship, who's like in the Royal Rumble and you like desperately want them to win and they win, then that tells you, oh, they've got like the power level, like the company has a level of stock in them. They're like this important of a character in the broad story that is this show that like, oh, maybe they could win the title at WrestleMania. And as a fan of that wrestler, that would be a amazing yeah, yeah it's like how right now roman reigns has had the title for over a year yeah he's like undefeated monster uh putting on a great show his performance is awesome but like eventually someone's gonna have to beat him who's that person gonna be it'll be exciting if it's a wrestler you like because then it's like someone who you're like oh yeah i was hoping it'd be Big E, but well it's like uh you know like uh, i often think about like star wars is the thing for this or like you know it's like if when Luke Skywalker beats Darth Vader, spoilers for <laughs> the Jedi, uh, like when that happens, that means something to you because you understand how powerful Darth Vader is. And Luke Skywalker's hopefully, if the movie's doing its job right, a character who you invested in and you want to win. So if he beats Darth Vader, then like that also says a lot about like him as a person and like him reaching his full potential in his character arc. Like, yeah. Like, I think that in current wrestling, like, the Hangman Page arc in AEW is such a great example of that, of, like, this is a wrestler, this is a storyline that's been going for about two years. 
Um, Hangman Page is a um, really great um, kind of like younger wrestler. He's in his 20s. Alcoholic he, um, cowboy? Yeah, alcohol he's a, an anxious millennial cowboy is his gimmick, <laughs> uh, which pretty much well describes him. He's a wrestler who um, used to be in this group called The Elite, which was basically the people that founded the company. And he wrestled for the world title against Chris Jericho, who's one of the main wrestlers um, in AEW and really just like a legendary wrestler in his own right. He lost that title match two years ago and it just dropped him into this like pit of despair of like not believing in himself. And that's basically started a two year storyline of us like wanting to see Hangman Adam Page like get his confidence back. So, you know, he's been, uh, you know, turned on from other wrestlers he's been kicked out of the elite he's um he joined a cult which like ended up being a good guy thing because the cult's also really cool it's called the dark, dark order. order yeah the dark okay. order that's right <laughs> yeah throw the cloth is the dark order thing um and you know it's it, basically like when hangman page wins the title like sure you know it's all predetermined or whatever but like in the storyline sense of like i'm watching a character learning to believe himself believe in himself him winning the title is like a sign of him reaching his true potential of believing in himself. And that's just like good storytelling. Yeah. You know, through the form of like flips and blade jobs and super kicks and <laughs> yeah. whatever, you know. This all reminds me of the way that we as horror fans talk about our favorite final girls specifically. Because yeah. we we look at our all our favorite final girls and people get so passionate defending their favorites and, you know, in terms of how they stack up to other final girls. Like, well, Lori Strode you know, she she fended off Michael Myers like that. Yeah. You know, like and, and people get so amped talking like, oh, well, you know, Nancy knows how to build like traps and stuff to, you know, get Freddy. And none of that's real. That's all yeah. scripted and made yeah. up. But still, you get excited thinking about like these characters and what's essentially their stats as like a horror movie survivor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And people get very passionate about who they think is the toughest when like it's not real but you still get so invested in them as like a survivor and as a tough person. It's it's such a a powerful yeah story that you buy into and yeah it is impressive that Lori survived Michael. Like that the writing of that movie is so effective that you are impressed by it even though you know it's not real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like nobody nobody looks at Friday the Thirteenth and says fake like <laughs> yeah. you know it's like we understand that what we're watching is a predetermined thing it's scripted it's like but it's like we're invested in the journey of these characters and you know I, I do think that that is really similar in that like yeah I mean how many times have we had theoretical conversations with our friends about like how we'd survive a zombie apocalypse or whatever yeah, you know? exactly. or you know who would win Michael versus Jason and yeah, then totally. you look at their stats and you say well Michael's gone this long and killed this many people that's saying you started at number one and ended up winning the rumble yeah you know? that's saying you've won the title 16 times mm -hmm. so like how are you going to stand up against like I don't know a literal vampire <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, speaking of, uh, I guess, vampires, and we're talking about horror characters now, I kind of want to go through specific wrestlers and characters and personas and talk about um, some well-known ones and maybe some not well-known ones. There's some on here I had never heard of before that I'm very excited to talk about, such as Doink the Clown. Oh, you've never heard of Doink? Oh, I've Doink's, heard Doink's Doink great. Doink the Clown. <laughs> I'm very intrigued. I guess, let's just start off with Undertaker. Undertaker. I think yeah. Undertaker's the standard. The not only wrestler. just for a horror wrestling character, but probably wrestling character. Uh, mm -hmm. Period. He's one of the the most long standing wrestlers from uh, 90, 91. Yeah, he debuted as a character, I think it's Survivor Series 1990 or 1991 yes. or something. Yeah, like The that. Undertaker yeah. did. I think and, 1991. And he yeah. went through several phases, uh, but for most of those first 10 years of wrestling, he was some variant of the Dead Man, the Phenom. But there was always some kind of mystical element. He had some, uh, uh, were, were there not graveyard matches? Were they graveyard uh, matches? Uh, or buried alive matches. Buried alive matches. Yeah, yeah. That he always lost. Because it <laughs> gave him some time to, to like be off screen for a while. Yeah, it's and like, oh, he's like, Mark Keller is and actually so, injured and needs a rest. Let's <laughs> yeah. bury him into this, into this grave. But then, so yeah, in kayfabe, he actually gets buried and yes and, and he dies there. he has uh been was he crucified i think uh no he he crucified people he also he started a cult called the ministry of darkness mm -hmm. for a while that and had so, a lot of people yeah there was like yeah the edge was in it the brood was in it um uh, apa was yeah in it apa was in it midian viscera 
And um, he would, <laughs> all your favorites. <laughs> and um, yeah, he would, he had this Undertaker symbol that was basically a cross. Yeah. And one of the things that he would do as a heel is he would like beat up Stone Cold Steve Austin and then like chain him to this Undertaker symbol and then like hang him above the arena. <laughs> Didn't he um, uh, marry Vince's daughter, Stephanie McMahon, in a black wedding? Yeah, no, he was about to. Oh. He, so at a black wedding, he uh, the Undertaker kidnapped Vince McMahon's daughter, Stephanie McMahon, and was about to marry her in, yeah, like a, just an evil wedding ceremony. Not really sure what the difference between a black wedding and a normal wedding is. They didn't <laughs> yeah. really go into very much detail of the logistics. Was there a prenup? <laughs> I don't know. But um, he was about to. And then uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin came up and saved him, which was a great character moment because Stone Cold was feuding with Vince McMahon at the time. But he's enough of like a good human that he was like, oh, like the daughter of my enemy or not, I still don't want you to be married to this undead wizard against your will. <laughs> <laughs> so just mashup guy, Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> and then we mentioned managers before. And uh, not only in kayfabe, their job is to, you know, help the, the wrestler shepherd their career. But oftentimes they're paired with a wrestler to be their voice piece. Mm. Yeah. Whether it's whether it benefits the wrestler not to speak because of their uh, mysterious aura or sometimes they have a voice that doesn't match their persona, Brock, or uh, sometimes they're, they're just not good on the mic. They're, yeah. you know, talking is a big part of wrestling. Yeah, and if the ability to talk people into the room, to convince people to watch this match and to like really get out your character, your motivations and stuff like that. It's just like acting, you know, some yeah, people are and, charismatic, some people aren't, you know? Yeah, exactly. Some people are really good in the ring, but not good actors. And those people can benefit from having a manager do the acting and talking for them and let their actions speak for themselves. So Undertaker had this manager, Paul Bearer, Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Paul Bear. Paul Bear. Can I just say, okay, we, so last week we watched oh my God. Kane's horror movie, See No Evil. <laughs> and this is how I realized I had been confusing Kane and Paul Bear. And I had been like, Go, leading up to watching this movie, I had it in my head for some reason that I was about to watch like a Paul Bear horror movie. That would be fun. He was real would creepy. Be a lot of fun, I think. Paul Bear was what? Like a five foot, very rotund gentleman. Um, Obviously, his, his name uh, a play on Paul Bearer. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he had dark eye makeup. Uh, it, he kind of looked like an Adams Family member. I was going to say, yeah. very like Adams Family looking. Um, and he, uh, I get the reason for confusing them because in storyline, yep. he's Kane's dad. And Undertaker's oh, yeah. dad, right? No, no, no. Okay, no, okay, no, okay. No, okay. No, here we go, here we no, go. No, Kane and Undertaker are half brothers because Paul Bearer slept with. <sighs> Undertaker's mom, which was a big scandal and reveal in pro mm -hmm. wrestling in 1999. So yeah, different dads. Paul Bear was Kane's dad, whoever was the Undertaker's dad. Okay. Um, and Paul Bear also, I guess to like play up the mysticism, he would carry an urn to the ring, which mm -hmm. was the source of the Undertaker's power. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of times in matches where the Undertaker's getting beaten up, and then Paul Bear would like lift the urn in the air and then say like, <laughs> "Oh yes," oh, and then the Undertaker <laughs> would like turn into murder mode. <laughs> Uh, it was great. Yeah, and Undertaker uh, would do these superhuman things like he'd be all beat up and then just sit upright real fast. Yeah. And it's, a, it's a move that yeah. Michael Myers did in the first Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. Straight up. Behind, Straight and up, Jason yeah. does a lot. And so, yeah, Undertaker is a horror character. If you look up, like, GIFs of Undertaker, they're all of him, like, sitting up because it's such a good reaction. And then his... It's also just like... Doing the, like it's also yeah, just like the core the strength that it requires to, that you're required. Like I can barely sit up, so I'm just <laughs> impressed that you to can sit up without having to like to be kick like your feet to, up yeah, kick your feet up and be like <laughs> ar, 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 okay, there we go. Yeah, Undertaker. Well, yeah, he would uh, drag his thumb across his neck and say "Rest in peace." Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. His finisher was the tombstone pile driver, and then he would put his opponent's uh, hands in like a, a coffin pose and pin them that way, which was really cool. Yeah, he also had casket matches where the purpose of the match is to throw somebody into a casket and then close the lid um him and kane had an inferno match where there was like a ring of fire around the ring that's and so the cool. the way that you win the match is to set your opponent on fire <laughs> well yeah let's uh explain kane because undertaker you know he's this character who started in 1990 and then is it 96 or 97 kane rolls around 99 no, because I know 98. 97, because it was Hell in a Cell. It was the first Hell in a Cell, which I think was in 97. Okay, so it's Undertaker versus Shawn yeah. Michaels, the Heartbreak Kid, in a Hell in a Cell match. That has a giant Is cell. Is that the ass man? Uh, no, oh, that's, no, that's Billy, Billy Gunn. Gunn. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm an ass yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm 
went yeah. past. No, the opposite, uh, the opposite of a horror movie. character, uh, Mr. Ass, Billy Gunn, a delight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Shawn Michaels is, I think I'm cute. I know I'm sexy. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. You yeah, can the see the confusion. Kid. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. They were, they were both in DX. DX. Yeah. They're very, <laughs> different, different times, very, but they were in DX um, together. Very flirtatious entrance music. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hell in a Cell, giant cage around the match to contain the action. And Undertaker versus Shawn Michaels, they're in the cell. And then... Kane premieres. There, there, there have been some lead up. Paul Bear saying like, "Ooh, yeah. your brother's gonna come get you." <laughs> yeah, there are rumors of like, "You have a brother," like, and uh, I'm the dad. <laughs> like, yeah, because at this point, Paul Bear was a bad guy. He revealed like it was, it was this really interesting lead up. Where and this was, this was such an interesting time in pro wrestling in terms of fandom because I feel like this was like when a lot of people still, I guess, like believed it was real. Yeah, like. And so uh, I think that there was like a Monday Night Raw where like Paul Bear was like, I'm going to reveal a secret about The Undertaker. And the secret ended up being that, you know, he's got a brother or whatever. But like there were fans that literally while Paul Bear was walking to the ring, like jumped the barrier oh my and tried to physically stop <laughs> for real Paul Bear from revealing The Undertaker's secret. <laughs> Holy shit. I love it's, that it's so like much. so cool. Yeah. That's <laughs> it's so good. Rad. The fact that like... Paul, especially because Paul Bear, he's not, he just looks the way, he, like, just Google him if you don't know what he looks like. He looks like if Pugsley grew up and yeah. styled himself after yes, Gomez. exactly. 100%. The, the fact yeah. that that man, at, people were like, we must stop him. This is <laughs> real life. You know, it's yeah, so yeah. cool. Well, and that speaks to, like, that speaks to, like, if you follow it, like, the talent of these performers to create you, to, to cause you to believe in it this much, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so Kane premieres, rips the door off the hell and stuff. I, uh, Kane, early, yeah. early Kane is one of my favorite wrestlers. Oh ever. yeah, he's great. Yeah, His he's look, very is, large. Yeah, I mean, both him and Undertaker are Big probably boys. six five, six seven. They're probably they're the built types of six, wrestlers nine. that yeah. when they're when you're watching them in the ring for a long time, and someone who is like maybe six feet tall gets in the ring with them, your sense of scale is just so fucked up that you assume this very tall person is like the I always thought The Rock alive. was an average height man because he was always fighting Undertaker, yeah, Kane, yeah, Big yeah. Show. No, Rock's 6'5". Right. Like, yeah. yeah, it is nuts. Uh, the Big Show is a real, an actual seven foot, seven foot of wrestler, maybe a little bit over seven feet. And to see him live is just uh, an acknowledgement of how small we are as people. Yeah. <laughs> or just how huge they are. Like, Kane is... You know, regardless of whether he's 6'5 or 6'6 six, six or 6'7, six, he is gigantic. Yeah. Like, the average person standing next to Kane looks like a baby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he, his original he's, outfit was this, like, uh, tight red leotard with, like, a black uh, top part to it. Yeah. And then the, the thing that made him Kane was his mask, which was originally a full-faced, hard mask that was also red and black. And then he had his long, curly hair hanging out of it. It was so fucking cool. Yeah, and he also, like, shot fire. At, like, yeah, he would get stiff. into the ring, stand in the middle, raise his hands, and then when he brought them down, fire would erupt from the four posts. Yeah, I have here that he... So he was 97. Okay. Um, and he was introduced as Undertaker's brother, who was out to take revenge on the Phenom for an arson incident associated with Oh, that yeah. That killed his oh, parents. Yeah. yeah, this was it. Is Yeah, the Undertaker... So the reason... And this is like, oh, man, we're getting into it. So <laughs> the urn that Paul Bearer carried carried around contained I think the rumor was or the insinuation was that it contained the ashes of the Undertaker's parents who he burned who died down. in a fire yeah. and that was the reveal is Paul Bear was like I'm gonna reveal what really happened to your parents yeah and it was like Undertaker started the fire accidentally when he was a kid or something like that something like that I yeah. think that was was that the basis of the haunted house they did for Horror Nights because there was an oh, Undertaker right. oh, Horror Nights sure. house and I think yeah. it was like because they have videos of him going through it and this is but, but he was American, American badass he's American badass, badass of... going through the Undertaker maze and it's it's great, but he's just like, oh, yes. He's just kind of like improv the entire time and being like, oh, I remember this part of my childhood. It's, <laughs> it's so good. I think that's the basis of that. Though. Yeah. And it's also like it's so fun watching pro wrestling, how quick things turn on a dime sometimes of The Undertaker was, yeah, like the, an undead leader of a cult who was also a wizard and had magic powers. And then he lost a buried alive match to like the big show or something like that. He was gone for 10 months. And then he came out to uh, Kid Rock entrance music on a motorcycle, and now he's a biker. But he only had the Kid Rock entrance music for like a show or two. It switched to Limp Bizkit's Rollin'. That's Hell yeah. right. Yep. He yeah. has like a, a flag bandana. Well, it I was think? then. It, it was post 9/11 by then, maybe. I think so. Or oh, it was about. Okay. I know that post 9/11 he became real bike like American biker. Yeah. Yeah. But his yeah. Name, yeah his, it was the American badass. Yeah, and phase. then I, and then I think that. 
And then around two, th- like a couple years after that, he lost another Buried Alive match, and then he was gone for a few months, and then he came back again as the Dead Man. <laughs> well, no, there was the Big Evil, but isn't that just yeah, basically you, American? Yeah, Badass? Big Evil. Is, it was like it, a lot of them. It was like Big e- Evil Booger Red. I think was his nickname for <laughs> oh, a little God. while. Uh, very great nickname. Uh, yeah, and the American Badass, and then he lost another Buried Alive match, and then he came back as the the Dead Man Undertaker to wrestle Kane at like WrestleMania. 20 or something okay yeah and then kane and this was <laughs> james you could not believe my confusion here but let me let me yeah. just say that like i i'm not super familiar with with kane like undertakers he's undertaker he still does matches as undertaker yeah. kane i you know i didn't watch wrestling as a kid so i wasn't super familiar with him and kane the guy was Glenn in a Jacobs. horror movie oh. called See No Evil that James and I just watched. And the entire time I just know it's the Kane horror movie. I'm like halfway through this thing when I asked James, like, wait, is this like part- No, because I'm like, uh yeah, oh yeah, by the way, his character's name is is Jacob Goodnight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So James goes, Oh, this the character's name is Jacob Goodnight. And I'm like, wait, so Kane is also named Jacob Goodnight, and you're like, wait. Did you think this entire time this was like Kane? Kane and I she thought, thought the movie was part of the the canon, the canon. I mean, <laughs> the but canon. it's but it's a weird like the red carpet for this movie. One of the funniest photos I've ever seen. Oh God! Is um because this was a this was a this was in theaters. This yeah. was like a, a two thousand five. Yeah, this was a release and yeah. um it, it wasn't awful. It's not that as far as a two thousand five slasher goes. And like Kane does a really good job as a horror movie lead. Sure. Like you could totally picture a world where he's like the next Kane. Hopper I heard the sequel like is also fun. Yeah, the, uh, the, I'm not sure if I've seen the sequel, but I've heard yeah, I've heard good things about it. Mm-hmm. But um the red carpet for this for the for the premiere of See No Evil. Everybody was wearing tuxedos, their finest outfits, as you would for a red carpet. Kane was shirtless wearing his wrestling tights. Yes. Oh, my God. So and at that point, wasn't Kane in wrestling? He he didn't have his mask on. He was shaved head. Like, he yeah. was just a big, bald guy, right? Yeah, he lost his mask in probably, yeah, 2005, 2006. Um, part of the part of the deal is the reason that he wore a full body um, kind of a full body suit when he debuted is that he was like horribly burned in this fire that the Undertaker set when they were kids. So he uh, he had like black makeup around his eyes. He he spoke with like a voice box like an yeah. electronic voice box for a little while, and then they slowly shedded that stuff. And then he lost like a, a title versus mask match against Triple H in like 2003, 2004, 2005, somewhere around there. And um, he took off his mask, and he was not horribly burned. And they retconned it, and they were like, they were psychological scars. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, then he didn't have a mask for a while. And it was just Glenn Jacobs was like, I don't want to wrestle with a mask anymore. Yeah, Because right? yeah. it's a pain in the ass. Okay, so my confusion about the horror movie, like, this is this character supposed to be Kane, is not too ridiculous. I, well, the, the part of the confusion for you was it's credited as Kane in See No Evil. Yeah. But I had to explain, that's like how when The Rock started acting, it was The Rock in The Scorpion King. Right, sure. The character we were watching in The Scorpion King wasn't The Rock. It's not Dwayne Johnson playing The Rock, playing... Yeah, so it wasn't Glenn King. Jacobs playing Kane, playing right. Jacob Goodnight. It was Glenn Jacobs credited as Kane, playing Jacob yeah, Goodnight. Then I like, thought, like, like, wait, is it part of the, the kayfabe that... Kane also has an acting career and is in, but okay. Then I understood I mean, what was. I think happening. I think that yeah, I think that yes. In kayfabe, Kane, the character, auditioned for this movie. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. was cast in because I movie. did watch an interview on a Monday Night Raw where he's like, "I have a new movie coming out." <laughs> <laughs> they also did a really genius. I don't know. I love pro wrestling. They did a really <laughs> so genius dumb. thing where the movie came out on May nineteenth. And the reason that I remember that is that they were like, oh, we got to like tie this into his story. So May 19th, they retconned is like, oh, that's the day that his parents died in that fire. Mm -hmm. So whenever he hears the date, May 19th, he goes crazy. So he was a good guy at the time. So all the bad guys would say May 19th at him. Then he'd come out and beat him up. And uh, so it was just a way to like really drive into you that May 19th is the day that his movie comes out. Wow. You know what? That's not bad marketing. Yeah. Now I still remember it 15 (laughs) years later. (laughs) There's a scene where he masturbates over his pants in that movie and it i'll never unsee it i wonder if his constituents have seen that right um so this is a i guess a weird vince mcmahon story that's maybe tmi but we're already talking about it so why not 
Uh, Vince McMahon was very passionately pitching that Kane, that Jacob Goodnight, Kane's character's penis, was three feet long. <laughs> when I, James tweeted that we were watching this, that was every single reply. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the yeah. first time I read it, I was like, this person just fucking around. It's like, so no, no, no. But when that's so every many reply, I was like, wait a minute. So, yeah, Vince McMahon, real, real maniac. <laughs> Why the, like, he thinks so dicks are funny, he thinks farts are funny. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's a 75 year old man with the uh, uh, comedic sensibilities of 13 year old. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what if, I want to talk about because I I feel like uh, let me see because yeah, Undertaker came, Paul Bearer. Um, then we also have Sting. Sting, I also don't know a ton about. Does Sting count as like a horror themed? Uh, well, I, his makeup is after uh, the Crow, so. I would say that Sting like kind of loosely fits sort of a horror vibe in that um, when Sting debuted, he was a surfer. He's yeah. from Venice Beach. His uh, face paint was like, you know, just like bright colors, blues, reds, stuff like that. And then he, um, I think, was beat up by the NWO, which was Hulk Hogan, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash. They were a big professional wrestling um, faction that debuted in WCW. And Sting was like the centerpiece of WCW up until this point. So he got beat up at the NWO. And then for a year straight, he just showed up in the rafters, dressed up like the crow with a baseball bat. Yeah. That's in my these notes here. Is it reminded me of like Fan of the Opera or yeah, something. Yeah, it's like pro wrestling Fan of the Opera is a really good way to look at it. Yeah. He would just, the camera would cut to him. I think that there were a few times where he was essentially like Batman, where it's like somebody's getting beaten up by the NWO. And then he like would take a zip line down to the ring and then beat everybody up with a baseball oh bat God. to save this wrestler from the <laughs> NWO. And then finally, after a year, he wrestled Hulk Hogan. And uh, lost the match, which was a bad booking decision. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah, my yeah. God. Yeah, yeah. That was Hulk Hogan doing backstage politics. And of then he would course. lose the match, which is another level of wrestling that you appreciate is the backstage <laughs> drama of it. But um, he just, he's just since then maintained this character of he's kind of the crow meets uh, surfer guy. So, like, he's not, like, a traditional horror character. He doesn't really have magic powers. But he's kind of, like, Sting... He, the, the crow batman style vigilante and now he's at. he's the mentor of darby allen yeah. who seems kind of horror uh oh, yeah, adjacent he does, like, the also skeleton makeup, he has like right? half skeleton face paint he's more of like a punk because he, he's well, a yeah. skateboarder and that homage to gg allen which because mm-hmm. i asked you i was like wait is that an homage and when i oh, googled for sure. yeah it has yeah, I didn't to be know that, yeah <laughs> yeah uh but like his finisher is the coffin drop that yeah, yeah, yeah. Like should be thing. coffin flop. yeah that's what that's the thing is like he's been wrestling for a while uh you i think you should leave season two came out recently <laughs> and now like people chant coffin fluff <laughs> you may of course the aew crowd chants because it's like oh yeah we're all like yeah we all love i think you should leave and think uh corn cob tv coffin flop is yeah, the best thing ever absolutely. i feel like i feel like corn cob tv really got robbed in the emmys this year yeah. i think coffin flop oh, really should have won yeah <laughs> none of it's rigged it's yeah, all yeah. Real. just um, like wrestling just like wrestling exactly um, I didn't book shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we talked about uh, Gangrel. Oh, okay. We have to talk about oh. Mankind. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And and another person we have to talk about. But yeah, yes. we can start with Mankind. Uh, played by Mick Foley, my favorite wrestler. Yeah. I feel like Mick Foley, <laughs> like as I've gotten to understand wrestling and get into it, he strikes me as like just the, like the wrestling fans wrestler. Like he... I don't know how to just like he's it's like how like music nerds love Frank Zappa <laughs> like wrestling nerds love Mick. I don't Foley. know because Zappa's whole thing was his technical proficiency, and Mick Foley sure. is far from but a you... technically proficient wrestler. Sure. Okay. So I think a wrestler's a wrestling fans wrestler would be like Cesaro or like maybe mm. even someone more indie who I couldn't even name that sure, you could probably okay. yeah like Brian Danielson. Um, oh sure yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um so uh. Mankind slash Mick Foley is an interesting case where the reason that he's like, I would say, a wrestling fan's wrestler is that um, he's somebody that, you know, he can't jump the highest. He's maybe not like he's he's big, but he's not like hugely muscular or anything like that. You know, he doesn't have like movie star good looks like The Rock, but he's a guy that just like wants it and will go as far as humanly possible in and out of character to like be an entertaining person you know, master of his craft. He's somebody that like would drive like 12 hours one way and sleep in his car for like a wrestling match where he'd wrestle for 10 bucks. Like he's just one of those guys that like you, you're you engaged in his journey because of how hard he's working to follow his dreams. And then in the ring, it's like he'll do like just the most insane stunts 
like to entertain you and tell the story of a match. Like one of the most famous wrestling matches of all time is um, versus The Undertaker, Hell in a Cell, 1998. Have you seen that match? Oh yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, many yeah. times. Yeah, and, um, <laughs> he, it's still like it's incredible. I mean, it's probably the most famous wrestling yeah. uh, bump of all time. And like he does a spot, a bump, or a spot. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, he does a spot where he, The Undertaker, throws him off of the top of probably a 20 foot cell. It's mm-hmm. really and tall, yeah. this was a second Hell in a Cell match, and he flew. And in one take in front of a live audience, landed on just a wooden table. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he got up and continued the match. Well, no, they start to carry him out. Yeah, they out. start to carry him out. He gets off the stretcher. Gets off the stretcher. <laughs> and, like, it looks like like this probably, you know, there was no crash pads. He had a small table to land on, which probably cushioned his fall a little bit. But this was not, like, in any way a crash pad. This probably, like, dislocated his shoulder for sure to do it. Yeah, he gets up the stretcher, climbs back up the cage, fights the Undertaker, and then the Undertaker picks him up and choke slams him through the cell, which was not supposed to happen. No. And he lands basically like on his shoulder and neck in the middle of the ring, another like 15 foot fall. With a chair that yeah, like hit a, him in the face? Yeah, a chair lands on his face. Yeah, yeah. It knocked a tooth, tooth out of his mouth, through, through his, his lip, and then into oh. his nose. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, you, so there's a famous <laughs> shot of him with a tooth sticking out of his nose. And he got up, continued the match, and then he got slammed on thumbtacks. Oh, yeah, and like, that he brought out. Yeah, that he brought out. So it's his own fault for that. <laughs> but it's like, oh, you know, regardless of whether wrestling is, like, predetermined or not, like, this is somebody who, like, put their body on the line to entertain us. And as fans, because we understand that this is a work, that this is, you know, that this is predetermined, we appreciate that this person was willing to, like, go this far. And, you know, like... When wrestlers, you know, like we, we talked about blade jobs earlier, like if a wrestler is willing to like cut their forehead so much that they've got divots in their head, it's like there's an appreciation for us as fans of like, oh, how badly they want to entertain us, you know? It's yeah. why I like Jackass so much. I'm such yeah. a huge fan of Jackass. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I loved watching it. And I you don't want all... them to get seriously hurt. Yeah. No, like, but, you know. The, the risk is what makes it. It's so, yeah. and the fact that like they seem to just live for it and they are, they all sign up for for it you know mm-hmm. and it's it's something that they want just because they want to entertain you it's but, yeah what's like i think as fans like especially as people you know in the entertainment industry we like appreciate the sacrifice yeah and it's like that's something that makes us really appreciate you know wrestlers entertainers performers stunt people etc that are like that into you know that are that into it and you know there there, there is definitely a line where it's like maybe you go too crazy yeah, oh yeah like you know like chair shots from the rock yeah yeah stuff like that where it's like oh that's maybe that crosses the line of like oh that's just a you're crazy for doing that yeah there are many things that you know a few decades ago maybe even just a decade ago you yeah. can't do anymore yeah like taking a chair shot to the head Lots of wrestlers end up suffering from um, serious CTE. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so many wrestlers from the Attitude Era are dead now. Half the people we've mentioned yeah. are, people, have like yeah. died uh, very young. Yeah. But they don't do those things anymore, thankfully. Yeah. Mick Foley's still alive, but he had to retire at 34. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, he, uh, because uh, we were talking about mankind, Mick Foley had the three faces of Foley. There was Dude Love, which was actually his first ever wrestling persona uh, in his backyard and on his own. Yeah. That was like a hippie guy who was like a cool cat. And I love that guy. Uh, there's Cactus Jack, who is his like hardcore death, of the match. death match. Yeah, like barbed Those wire. Exploding replacing. ring matches. Yeah. Uh, and then Mankind was his first WWE yeah. uh, persona. Yeah, Mankind was his first WWE persona. And um, the reason that he relates to horror is that he's mm. a character that's very inspired by Hannibal Lecter from um, Silence of the Lambs. Um, like he would come out in like a mask that was very much patterned after Hannibal Lecter's mask. No, oh, with he, the two like metal pieces. Yeah, the, like, yeah, the yeah. metal pieces. It's like leather um, straps. It reminds me of Leatherface too, in terms of his like demeanor. Yeah, he would like um, shave a spot of his head off or his hair off. Yeah, uh, he would like rip out his own hair yeah, sometimes. Yeah. He also this was a specific. Um, you can read about it in McFoley's book. Have a nice day. A specific inspiration from the character um, is he would come out to like this really spooky uh, kind of music and then. After he would win a match, like beautiful piano music would play. Yeah. And that was like a specific shout out mm. to Sounds of the Lambs of like beautiful mm-hmm. piano music playing after like horrifying things, mm-hmm. you know? 
Yeah, for um, sure. And yeah, he started off as a very deranged character. He had a yeah. boiler room match with the Undertaker. Yeah, he lived in a boiler room. He had a boiler room <laughs> brawl. Uh, yeah, he he ended up being a more comedic, sympathetic character. He his catchphrase became "Have a nice day." And uh, he would like have he he developed a sock puppet I named Mr. Sacco Sacco. and a friendship with the Rock and yeah, all the sorts rock and of sock things. connection. Yep. Uh, but for a while, he was more of a dark, like brooding. Like he would squeal like a pig, right? Yeah. And yeah. He, yeah. He would squeal like a pig, and he was very much like he's a character that I was terrified of. Scary. Yeah. You know, uh, when he first started wrestling, and then you know, like as I kind of smartened up as a fan and started to learn the backstage stuff i kind of realized oh this is cactus jack that guy that would like do all the crazy stuff in wcw and like they also did interviews between him and jim ross who's like a famous wrestling commentator talking about like his real backstory and like all the actual sacrifices that he's made to be a wrestler and that's something that like though it was like i guess uh fake wrestling character stuff but inspired by his real life like, they actually showed real footage of him as Dude Love when he was a teenager, this wrestling character. Like, it really caused you to warm up to him as a character of, like, oh, he's, like, a person who, like, is really going for it to follow his dreams, you know? Yeah, it's like when you learn about Robert England. He's like, yeah, oh, he's a really well-trained actor mm-hmm. when playing this scary guy. Yeah, just leading into it, like, a thousand percent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, something I wanted to talk about, um, just you bringing up uh, Leatherface, is that... A lot of pro wrestling horror characters are kind of like derivative in a way. Um, you know, like uh, Kane is very much patterned after, you know, uh, Jason from Friday the 13th. But there was literally in Japan a wrestler called Leatherface who was gimmick was he was Leatherface from <laughs> oh, Texas Chainsaw I love Mask. that so much. Um, he would come out with a chainsaw. He wore the apron. He had the mask. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's something that's like straight derivative. Uh, Chainsaw Charlie. Chainsaw um, Charlie was, is in uh, my notes. Terry, Funk. Terry Funk's character mm-hmm. in WWE before they were just like, wait a second, this is a famous pro wrestler from the 70s. Let's just have him be Terry Funk. <laughs> that guy's still alive, huh? Yeah, Terry Funk's still alive. Nice. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but like, so that's an example of a character that's like very derivative of horror stuff. But then you get characters like you mentioned Alexa Bliss, the Bray Wyatt, the Fiend. That's what I wanted to talk to. Yeah, about which like sure. feels like such a uh, unique, like, I've never really seen. Like Mister Rogers, but you know horror movie villain in horror. Movies. Yeah, yeah. So Bray Wyatt is a uh, rot- rotunda. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, rotunda, which is a rotunda, is a wrestling family. Erwin R. Scheister, IRS, uh, an evil wrestling tax man, <laughs> is his dad from the. Uh, he was from the nineties. Uh, he's uh, he would uh, he wrestle a lot of matches right around April fifteenth, and people booed him because his catchphrase was oh, just like everybody's got to pay their taxes. Oh or my something. god! I forgot that he was second gen, and his I know that yeah. his brother was also in there. Bo. Yeah, Bo Dallas. Bo Dallas. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, Bray Wyatt. Uh, he, when did he come into WWE? Uh, Mid twenty tens. Um. So he came in. Um. He came in as. I, I forget Husky Harris was his original oh, character. Right. In NXT. That's why he has the pig puppet who was Husky. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. It was his catchphrase he was like he was the like the Sherman tank with a Ferrari engine or whatever. Oh my God. And um he wrestled in NXT and on the main roster a little bit. Um in, in like, you know, 2010, 2011, somewhere oh, around wow. there. Okay. And then he um it was just kind of like a bland character without like a lot going on other than like he's a bigger guy who has le- who's athletic. Mm-hmm. And then he went down to kind of uh the developmental territories and developed this character called Bray Wyatt. Yes. Who's kind of like a cult leader, swamp preacher guy. Great sort of, character. Yeah, based yeah. off Cape Fear, kind of like that, that sort of vibe. And it, yeah, it was a great character. And like they um he Crowd kind of, favorite, yeah. Right? Crowd. He was like a heel that became a crowd favorite because he was so cool. Yeah, he would come out to an awesome fucking music yeah, yeah, yeah. with a lantern. All the lights would be off. He'd have a lantern, and he had a whole uh, crew of swamp guys with him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Wyatt all, family. Who, they were all giant with long beards. They were great. <laughs> yeah, and then um, he uh, like you know lost a match a few years later, and then he um, you know was gone for a little while, and then he came back as a character called the Fiend. Yeah. Who um basically the best way to describe him is like creepy pasta the wrestler. <laughs> a little where, bit, yeah. Where it's sort of like, oh, you'd see these um, you know, this is after Bray Wyatt was a character on TV for years. You'd see these like things that look like a kid show called Fly- Firefly Funhouse, hosted by Bray Wyatt. He called his fans as Fireflies, where he was kind of doing a Mr. Rogers character. Mm-hmm. But then he kept on talking about this character named the Fiend, like in sort of like hushed tones. You wanna see my secret? 
And then The Fiend showed up to wrestle a match, you know, a few months later at SummerSlam. We were there. As like there, the most yeah. terrifying, like designed by Tom Savini. Yes, literally <laughs> like, wrestled in a mask designed by Tom Savini yeah, Studio. He um, carried a lantern as a reference to his Bray Wyatt character, but the lantern looked like his own head. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, coming out to like this insane, like crazy metal version of his theme. Oh, so cool. Uh, it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like such a, I guess, fully formed, unique horror idea that's like we understand as something inspired by horror movies but it's like the pieces are so distinct and different that it really feels like its own original idea yeah yeah it was incredible the vignettes he would do was incredible i remember because you know we started watching january 2019 yeah. he bray wyatt was off uh he was gone at mm -hmm. that point and then these little vignettes started popping up with his puppets his like deranged yeah. puppets and i remember typing online be like what the fuck is this and people were like dude we think it's bray wyatt and i was like okay cool and then he shows up in those in the Mr. Rogers get up and he's talking about the fiend and he's like, Oh, he's gonna be mad when he shows yeah, up. It's just like, yeah, the like fiend, the fiend is gonna yeah, be real mad yeah, about but this. Like, let him in. Yeah, and yeah. uh yeah, let me in. It was his catchphrase. But you yeah. would say it like, let me in in a way that's terrifying. Yeah, and then Chelsea and I went to SummerSlam where yeah, he you had let his him in. First, you let him in. We let him into our hearts. Yeah, yeah. And I remember as SummerSlam was continuing, match after match after match kept happening, and I was like, Dude, we still haven't gotten to The Fiend. They're doing it right before the main event. Like, this is going to be a big deal. Mm -hmm. And it fucking was. It, yeah, the mood there was insane. Like, it's, I feel like watching, because we've, we've gone <sighs> to a few so matches cool. in person. <laughs> and, you know, it's rare to have a match or, like, even an entrance where everyone feels, like, 100%, like, tuned in. You yeah. Because people will be, like, talking. And, you know, it's, but when he came out, I feel like every single person, all right, it was just, like, yeah, like, it was insane. Like, yeah. We all agree this is cool as shit. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And um, yeah, and he was like, he did such a great job with that character, and it was just like such a fun. Like he won the universal title, and then he replaced the title belt with a belt that looked like it was made out of his own face. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just like the levels of like horror inspiration of this character are great. And then um, uh, Bray Wyatt, he uh, uh, unfortunately was released by WWE um, like maybe a month or two ago. You know what I didn't and realize? Uh, I, I've said this. They released this wrestler and some of my friends were like, is, what, is that what they call it when they fire them? It's like, yeah, yeah. oh yeah, I guess release is kind of also jargon. Yeah. A little yeah. bit. Yeah. It's like, no, they released him into a field. They were just like, <laughs> yeah, you're free like, now. Oh, yeah, free. Um, no, yeah he's, he was fired. <laughs> and um, and uh, Alexa Bliss, um, who's another great wrestler, adopted a lot of kind of his character traits. And Alexa Bliss, very talented performer. She's doing really great with it. Actual horror yeah. fan, too. Yeah, yeah huge yeah. horror fan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there was also, I think, like she... She appeared at WrestleMania this year with like a bloody crown designed by Tom Savini with like goo shooting at him. Oh, it was like, cool. it was like, oh, cool as shit. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, Wyndham Rotunda is the guy's, is Bray Wyatt's real name. I can't wait to see what he does wherever he lands. Whether it's AEW or not. AEW, NJPW. Yeah. Like he's just like clearly to come up with so many great like nuanced character traits and like, mm -hmm. you know, Bray Wyatt, the Swamp Preacher and the Fiend are two very different characters. Yeah. Well, you know, as a, I think that if you're a fan of horror movies and want to get into wrestling, like that guy is yeah. the person to follow. He's definitely someone where when, you know, I was starting to get into like the Fiend stuff and the lead up to that and like seeing that in person, I just, I think I was just so blown away by, yeah, how amazing of a storyteller he is and how creative he is and how just like specific his ideas are yeah. and how well he makes them work and the way he performs these characters is so fucking impressive i think that he was i, I just wish that he was allowed to do so much more yeah because that's with, honestly that's one of my uh complaints about wrestling especially wwe is it can often be broad and kind of um right. dumbed down and they don't want to get too nuanced with things because uh, I think that's Vince's uh, strategy to appeal to the largest audience is just dumb it down, make it broad strokes. But like Bray Wyatt knew how to deal in the specifics and it, it was and it so became appreciated. Like, I mean, that character was huge. Like oh, everyone yeah. was yeah. into it. And it's just so frustrating that I feel like they didn't really realize like, oh, people like this thing. well they had him drop like... the belt to goldberg at their saudi yeah. arabia show and then like they had the weird hell in the cell finish with seth like they, yeah the booking decisions really fucked up the character yeah turned the fans kind of against him and but i think that that's another thing that like i appreciate as a wrestling fan is like we're fans of these wrestlers as performers yeah so like we appreciate their character arc and stuff like that but also like oh we see bray wyatt Wyndham rotunda whatever the fiend whatever you want to call him we see that like, oh, this guy is an amazing performer. So in the same way that you'll like, 
you know, watch a movie because an actor that you like is in it. You'll watch a wrestling company or a match or whatever because a wrestler that you like is in it, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely very, very similar. And yeah, it also, the, these horror characters do feel a lot like the, the way that we root for our favorite horror villains and we get yeah. attached to them and like kind of fall in love with them. Like I, yeah, like I personally, everyone knows I love Leatherface, like <laughs> anything Leatherface, I'm super into it in the same way. I just get so, it's like you, you, yeah, you get attached to these characters, even if they're portrayed to be like specifically very evil. Although I guess the fiend, there's some nuance there because he's got the hurt. Yeah, he's heel. got the hurt gloves he's and very, the heel yeah, gloves. Yeah, so he's very tortured. If you listen to D and D and D, the Zappa's white and black gloves, I referred to them before as the hurt and heel gloves. They were uh, user submitted item that I was like, oh man, it's like the fiend hell gloves. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I feel like we could talk for hours more. Uh, yeah, it's like now to talk about Freddy Blassie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, we should probably at least address Doink the Clown before we wrap oh, up. Oh, yeah, you did bring I him did up. I promise, yeah. promise okay, people. Okay, now is Doink the Clown time. What is Doink the Clown? Uh, he's, he's an evil clown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I think... I think Wasn't the, there a second Doink? Um, there, there actually there have been several doings. Oh, Alex! Oh no! Welcome to the next Shit. forty minutes of this podcast. <laughs> oh, uh, so, Doink the Clown was a character that was introduced in. Um, I want to say like the early nineties. Um, I new I forget, gen era. Yeah, like I kind of with Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, kind of that era. That was one. Uh, so many characters were uh, occupation, right? Right. Like, yeah. Also, yeah. right yeah. after the It miniseries, pointedly. Yeah. Ooh, maybe. Oh yeah. He's very. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's very. He played it very much like he was. Like the kids PG version of Pennywise. Mm-hmm. Um, like he was very much a villain. He would do clown stuff, but he would do it in a way that was evil. And um, but then he, because he's a wrestling clown, he eventually became a face because like, oh, it's all uh, laugh and pull, applaud the clown. And then he um, he he like had a lot of like little people who came with him, like Dink, Pink, Stink, oh like an entourage gosh. of like little people clowns. Uh, he feuded with Jerry the King Lawler, a pro wrestling king from Memphis. Uh, who also had his own like little people entourage. They had a Survivor Series match that was very fun. Are you serious? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh no. Um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, like there were multiple people because it was like a full body costume. The original guy, I think it was like Matt Bourne or something like that, um, was like a really genius pro wrestler. But he was also a guy that like you know suffered with a lot of his own kind of personal demons. So he was released by WWE and then. Um, replaced doink was replaced by i think the brooklyn brawler wrestler started playing the role of doink um and there have been a couple of other people who have like played the role of doink over the years and um but the original doink run was just such a great character played by an amazing pro wrestler performer so people that character was well well received yeah he was well he's he's thought of in his heel bad guy initial pennywise the clown inspired run he's thought of as very well received he like definitely jumped the shark a little bit when he turned face and just kind of became just a clown. Yeah, like, you know, instead sure. of a clown with a levels, you know. But that happens with so many. Like Kane had some awful story arcs. Oh yeah, totally. You know, like every wrestler, it's rare for a wrestler to stay popular the whole time. Like I said, even the Fiend, some fans started to turn against. I'd say he was still pretty popular. Yeah. throughout the whole run, but uh, um, yeah, uh, so. To loop it back to The Undertaker, a wrestling group that has been really great at staying fresh is The New Day, which is an amazing faction. Uh, It's uh, Big E, Xavier Woods, Kofi Kingston. That's that's, uh, WWE champion, Big E. Oh, yeah. WWE champion. I'm following for Big E stuff. I follow for New Day stuff. Nice. But... um, like they have a horror movie coming out that's uh, starring The Undertaker. That's like the New Days in The Undertaker's Mansion or something. I'm like so that. sad that's on that, Netflix. Yeah, right? yeah, I'm sad it didn't come out before we recorded this, so we couldn't like play it together. Yeah, because yeah. it's an interactive. Thing. It is. It's just yeah, it's our like adventure. Match, yeah. Maybe we can somehow do that as commentary track for Patreon, and we can be like, we're gonna click this. If <laughs> maybe that's a lot of counting down to clicks. It would be hard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to do uh, something with it. Yeah, that's a, a 15 hour Patreon. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to that though. New Day's great. Yeah. I would do I would do a Patreon for like the first time that you just like what's one run through of yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah, we we can't go through every, every decision single tree decision. Of it. That would be nuts. Yeah. Um <laughs> I ha- honestly I have no love for the corporation that is WWE, right. but the individuals on the roster all those wrestlers, I love them so much. I just love wrestlers. Like I every time them. we've gone to see a show live, I have I can't boo anyone. I know you're supposed to. You're <laughs> supposed to boo the bad guys, the heels, but I can't. I just love all the wrestlers so much. We I have in fact for all of them. praised uh, King Corbin. King Corbin, yeah. 
I know. Our liege. I wanted I wanted to be like his like serfs, like his medieval serfs for WrestleMania <laughs> or something, where we come we're like basically Patsy from Monty That Pippen. would be like, fun. Yeah, that's what I want. That's my dream. <laughs> Well, cool. This was great. Thank you so much, Joey. Yeah, Joey, um, where should people find you? What should they What should they be on the lookout for? I know oh, that you man, brought a oh, yeah, yeah, I brought yeah. a I brought a sheet to pitch it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks again for having me on. This was so fun. Of um, so you can find me on Twitter at Joey Tainment. You can find me on Instagram at Joey Clift with like five or six eyes. A 12-year-old took Joey Clift with one eye, so that's no. what I'm left with. <laughs> and then um, I'm actually really excited to announce um, I just released a new animated short with Comedy Central. Um, it's called How to Cope with Your Team Changing its Native American mascot. It's a comedy PSA about sports teams who just changed their weird Native mascots. Cough, cough, Cleveland Indians, Washington football team, and a ton of others. Cough, cough, cough. Um, <laughs> I wrote it. I directed it. I star in it. And it's also featuring voices from Janice Smeeting and Tyler Clare from Rutherford Falls and John Timothy from Spirit Rangers, which is a really great Netflix show I'm writing on right now. So it's got an all-Native voice cast, too. That's amazing. So you can check it out on all of Comedy Central social media platforms. And then I also just got to say, like, I have uh, I know I was on the... the um, Indian burial ground episode a few years ago, but I'm still always getting positive feedback from dead meat fans on it. And it's like, oh, I gotta so say, cool. like you put together such a great fan base that's yeah. you know, oh, so yeah. supportive yeah. and nice of all the things Excellent. that I do. I still know? will get the occasional email about uh, someone being like, hey, uh, are you, will you still buy me that pamphlet? And I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. I totally forgot about that. I can't. That's so cool. People still email about that. Yeah. Yay. That's great. Oh, I that makes me so happy. Well, cool. Yeah, I'll post links to, I think it'll be out by the time. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Oh, if I'm in, I'm in big trouble if I just promoted it without it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, It's it comes out. So it will be out by the time. It's not out as of this second right. but by the time that you are watching this it will be out. cool cool yeah um right. yeah and it's gonna be on all of comedy central social media channels and uh, i'm excited about congrats, it congrats man yeah you're, you're always you know you're you're one of the most successful and uh consistently successful like r comedy writers i know personally mm. oh thanks yeah you're always doing cool stuff yeah uh likewise i appreciate that oh thanks man uh, yeah this is so nice thank you so much for joining us um i guess our social media i are you go yeah at dead meat james <laughs> on twitter instagram and tiktok, TikTok. i'm at carebeck c-r-e-b-c-c -C, on twitter and instagram um we think merch is coming back soon by the way we yeah, just we had, a had a meeting about today. it stay tuned i don't have mm -hmm. any specifics beyond that. wait is there any plan to do pro wrestling themed merch there should be i don't know maybe i mean you do have a dead meat title belt. yeah oh by the way this has been sitting on my lap this whole time <laughs> i have a dead meat uh championship belt it's called the kill count champion belt this was made by our youtube network made in with input from chelsea mm -hmm. they got this for me uh when i hit when we hit four million subscribers uh, this was their gift to us for that. It's got a little golden chainsaw side plate, doll machete side plate, bunch of flags. Uh, unfortunately, not Canada. I don't know why not. We love <laughs> oh, you, Canada. Yeah. But this is, uh, t to me, this signifies the kill count with the most amount of kills. So right now, this title holder is Zombieland Double Tap. And mm. I have been thinking of, I, I have had our assistant look at local uh, wrestling rings for me to film something at where I go over um, the championship history of like which kill count had the most amount of kills until they until were they were unseated. Yes, I because like that a lot. Uh, Final Destination had the title for like over a year, and it was beast. It was beaten by I think Zombieland. Before that, um, the the first Purge had it for mm. a really long time. So uh, yeah, I, I think that'd be a fun idea for a video um i'm so glad that my uh inviting you over to watch the royal rumble has inspired dude, us it, dude. it really such set off <laughs> yeah Yay. such a butterfly effect of me just being there like i remember standing in your kitchen being like so like are the new radicals still around like what's perry saturn up to <laughs> <laughs> i just liked basically because the royal rumble to me is like a fashion show yeah like, yeah which is like it's like yeah every introducing every 90 seconds somebody comes out in a fun outfit to a fun song yeah <laughs> yep. that's what i love i love yeah, all the yeah. do a spot or a fun bit you know hopefully kofi gets thrown out and his feet don't touch the ground yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. oh it's the best all yeah right. royal rumbles happen in january by the way so if you're oh, intrigued perfect. you gotta wait till january yeah, and uh, uh, AEW Dynamite every Wednesday, <laughs> AEW there's Rampage a every Friday. Dinosaur, AEW. Yeah, 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 Luchasaurus. Luchasaurus. Yes. He's a really nice guy. Yeah. 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 Love that. 
Uh, anyway, before we get <laughs> on to another hour of this. Yes. <laughs> uh, stay tuned for next week. Not sure what we're doing quite yet, but. Yeah, we'll have something. We'll have something. But uh, until then, I'm James. I am Chelsea. And this is Joey. Hey, everybody. I mean, bye, everybody. <laughs> bye. I say hi. Bye is what you say at the end of a thing. <laughs> this has been the Dead Meat Podcast.